My name is Yvonne Hunter. I am the head of cultural and special events programming at the Toronto Public Library. It is my great pleasure to welcome all of you here this evening. Michel Chikwinene was born in the Democratic Republic of Congo and grew up a spirited, soccer-loving, and sometimes mischievous child. But at the tender age of five, amidst upheaval in his homeland, he was kidnapped by a rebel militia and forced into warfare. Eventually, he escaped from his captors, but not without experiencing things that no child should ever have to. He ran for three days, and he found his way back to his parents. The years that followed were difficult. You can only imagine the kind of trauma that would come from that experience, and you're going to hear a little bit about it firsthand this evening. However, during the healing process, he learned that through sharing his story and empowering the peers in his new Canadian home, he could be a powerful agent of change. Child Soldier, When Boys and Girls Are Used in War, is Michelle's book. It is co-authored by Jessica D. Humphreys and illustrated by Claudia Davila, I believe both of whom are here this evening. Um, Jessica certainly is. She's going to be joining us on stage in a little while. This is a, a graphic novel. It's told um, with pictures and words to, to illustrate some fairly sensitive subject material. Obviously, it's a challenging subject to tackle, and uh, I think you will find, if you haven't already looked at this poignant and powerful story, which I cried when I read the galley, that it's very important. It's an important story to tell, and it's an important story to share. Um, I want to thank Kids Can Press and, and the Project Citizen Kid for, for bringing both this book and these authors to us this evening. President Lisa Lyons is here tonight. Um, and Michaela Cornell, who is handling the PR for the book, uh, has really done a remarkable thing, I, I feel, in, in bringing this project to me. Um, this morning, Michelle was on stage uh, with about 400 high school students, and it was moving and wonderful, and they had great questions. And a little later in the program, we will give you the opportunity to stand up and ask your questions as well. I want to say a little bit more about someone very important who's here to introduce Michelle this evening, um, but a little bit more about Michelle himself. He's a student, I believe, at the University of Toronto. He's an athlete. He's now an author. He's a children's rights advocate who sits on the advisory council of Lieutenant General Romeo Dallaire's Child Soldiers Initiative. As McLean's wrote in a piece last week, Dallaire and Chiquinine, two survivors of dark places, now let me find the rest of my notes, <laughs> um, both physical and psychological evoked in this book have high regard for one another. And I think when the two of them come to the stage, you'll understand just how powerful this dynamic is. Romeo Dallaire is a retired lieutenant general, senator, and celebrated humanitarian. In 1993, he was appointed force commander for the United Nations pardon me, the United Nations Assistance Mission for Rwanda, where he witnessed the country descend into chaos and genocide, leading to the deaths of more than 800,000 Rwandans. He understands better than anyone the physical and emotional devastation brought by warfare. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome General Romeo Dallaire. Thank you very much. And good evening and welcome. Uh, I am particularly happy to be here because of three uh, very specific reasons. Uh, the first one being that uh, Child Soldiers is my endeavor for, I hope, the rest of my life, which will last longer than a couple years. Uh, and uh, the subject, when it's touched upon, uh, with such depth and sensitivity, but reality, uh, it attracts certainly my attention and it helps us in the cause of eradicating the use of children as weapons of war, which this modern era has created in a scale that is in the hundreds of thousands. That's the first reason. Second reason, Michelle. 
uh, is a child soldier. We've done things together on, on stage. Uh, we've communicated. His insights have helped us build the programs that we are now using overseas. And currently, I have uh, two teams in Uganda. I have one in uh, Somalia uh, who are now, at this moment, training uh, military and police, and also uh, being uh, child protection officers in uh, missions and in countries uh, in Central and East Africa. And the third reason is my co-author, who helped me write my book on child soldiers and is currently, again, helping me write a third book on post-traumatic stress disorder, and 20 years of living with it, uh, and a fourth book on uh, the whole dimension of trying to strategically prevent conflict, and that's uh, uh, Mrs. Jessica Lee Humphrey, who's uh, been now, we've been nearly 10 years together uh, in our Writers Guild made up of two. My aim is to try to stay on stage for 40 minutes, but I know I won't be allowed. <laughs> and because I don't have 100 slides with me, I find myself at a loss to be able to uh, sustain uh, the interest in typical military fashion where we PowerPoint people to death. <laughs> and so I would like just to touch upon a, f a few elements, if I may. Uh, before we continue with the forum this evening. Uh, the first one is uh, one of whether or not we really believe uh, that all humans are human. And whether we really believe that every human being uh, is equal uh, within the construct of being a human being. Is it possible that some humans either think themselves more human than others, or is it possible that we've established a pecking order in humanity where some are in fact treated and responded to less than in other cases? The Rwandan genocide was a power-sharing uh, war, civil war, where we used an ethnic group as the target uh, and these extremists went after them to try to slaughter 1.2 million people. And they succeeded in slaughtering 800,000. But the slaughtering was done not by adults, but was done by indoctrinated young people, 14, 15, 16, 17, who had been brought into a political party youth wing and slowly over months been indoctrinated and shifted into hatred towards that other ethnic group and building confidence in them and making them cocky and pretentious and uniformed and, and pushing their weight around and ultimately turned them into a militia that did the slaughter. And so over 10,000 young people with machetes slaughtered over 800,000 of which nearly a million were injured in various degrees, and just under four million were refugeed and internally displaced. All that in a hundred days. But the mobilized force that was able to do it, to implement the plan, was the mobilization of young people. Men, young boys, sorry, and girls. For the world of child soldiers is made up of over 40% of girls and used in the whole spectrum of what one would expect in a low, te low technology, low intensity conflict, which is from the gun to gun AK-47 vision that we have on one end, all the way through to being porters, to being spies, to simply being bodies walking on mines to blow them up so that the more seniors could go, uh, to food and ultimately even boys, not as much, but boys and girls being used as sex slaves and bushwives. You can't find 
a weapon system that complete and that sustainable in the inventory anywhere in the world. And so with the proliferation of small arms that are light and with the mobilization of this extensive demographic aspect of these societies, where up to 50% of the population can be under 15, uh, you have established since the late 80s uh, a new weapon system that is being used extensively to the extent that last year uh, the Undersecretary of the United Nations confirmed that it was the worst year of employment of child soldiers. ISIS, Boko Haram, and Al Shaba count for over 100,000 child soldiers. And they're recruiting them at eight and nine years old. And they're putting them into schools. And they're indoctrinating them. And they wait till they're 12, 13, 14, and then they move them to the front lines. They're in it for a long haul of using children as the weapon of war and which create significant problems for those who are victims, for the children who end up in refugee camps as we were recently in Jordan on the Syrian border in the Syrian refugee camps where 14 and 15 year olds have been there for three years with no education, no chance of a trade, no chance to make money and seeing their future go up in smoke for they may not even be able to marry or make a family because uh, they are caught up in those refugee camps. Well, guess who's being recruited into the fight in Syria? By all sides, ISIS, by Assad, by the Free Syrian Army, and they're recruiting them younger, and they're going. And they're the ones that are being blown apart by a lot of the bombs that are being dropped. So we have this phenomenon uh, of the use of children. And the question, however, is, is how is it that we can handle this, this dichotomy of children there being weapons? And here we don't even want them to play war games on the TV, on their computer. Let me give you an example of how, in fact, maybe we have skewed our assessment of humanity. As I was mo moving between the fighting troops of both ethnic groups, the armies, they had behind their lines people of the other ethnic groups which we, which we were protecting, over 30,000 of them. And we were trying to move them between the lines safely. So I was going through this no man's land, which means the armies had pulled back and there's nobody there at that point. And up ahead, there was a little boy of about seven years old, six, seven years old, in the middle of the road. Now, what had been happening is, is that the extremists had been using young children, even of their own ethnic group, to put them in the roads where the humanitarian convoys would go by and force the humanitarian convoys to stop. If the children didn't stay in the road, they simply killed them. And so the convoys would stop and they would steal the water, medical supplies, food, wood and so on, and sustain the slaughter. So we approached this young boy and expecting there might be an ambush, we slow down, stop, jump out, no ambush. So we go to the huts along the road and we find bodies of people who had been killed weeks beforehand. And as we're looking for somebody to take care of this little boy where there shouldn't be anybody really, we lose the little boy. So we double back and we find him in a hut where there are two adults, male, female, and two children, and they're all half eaten by dogs and rats. And he's sitting there as if he was at home. So I picked him up and I brought him in front of my vehicle and I looked at him. And he was mangy and dirty and his stomach was bloated. He was in rags or flies all around him. But then I looked into his eyes. What I saw in the eyes of that seven-year-old boy in the midst of that genocide and civil war was exactly what I saw in the eyes of my seven-year-old son in Quebec City when I left for Africa. They were the eyes of a human child. And they were exactly the same. 
that boy in that scenario was just as human and counts just as much as my son back home. How is it that we abandon them? How is it that we recruit, we permit the recruitment, deliberate recruitment of those boys and girls to be the primary weapon systems to sustain conflicts around the world? I'm not just talking about the work we're doing in Africa. Colombia, extensively using Aboriginal children in particular. The Middle East, we're in Jordan. We're seeing all sides using children. Myanmar. Myanmar have been using child soldiers even in their army, let alone the rebel and non-state actors. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a weapon system of our era. And it is, although illegal, and the International Tribunal has made it a crime against humanity, the recruitment continues, the scale continues to increase, and the number of children that are slaughtered and dying and abandoned because of disease or injury also is on the rise. We can have all the rules and laws we want, but if nobody has the guts to want to apply them, Nobody has the intestinal fortitude to want to stop this and provide new tools to help stop it. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to see this continue. And that's why it's significant to tell you about it. That's why it's even more significant to tell our children about it, their peers. Their peers are weapons in other countries, 12 hours away by aircraft. And this book is one of those tools. We use comic books in other countries. This book is ideally suited for our children here, the young ones, to see the reality of what happens to their peers and to militate and influence the adults to engage and to assist those who are trying to stop it. And so that's what we try to do from the Child Soldier Initiative in, at Dalhousie, and that's what we hope others will join us and commit to ultimately eradicating not only the use of child soldiers, but eradicating, ladies and gentlemen, the thought in an adult that you want to use a child to do your fighting and your killing, your slaughtering, and your abuse. So bravo, to Michelle, bravo to Jessica and to Claudia for giving us another tool to educate our young about what's happening to their peers. So I'm prepared for another half hour to speak, <laughs> uh, but I'm getting the incredible warning signs here. And so I've been mandated to introduce Michelle. And it's rather interesting to find myself introducing an ex-child soldier who has come out of that horror and has been able to handle the impact of that and to be able to progress and be able to sustain the pressures of our societies even with that background and succeed. Michelle is keen, smart, hardworking. He's got a strong work ethic. He believes in human rights. He's seen the abuse of human rights. He has lived it, sustained it, and survived it. And that's why he is far more qualified than I am to speak to you about this weapon system called the child soldiers. Michelle. Wow. I, I have no words <laughs> to even say anything. Ladies and gentlemen, one of my greatest heroes, please, one more huge round of applause for the general. Thank you.
it is an absolute honor to be standing here in front of you tonight. I can't tell you how humbled I am to be standing here. And in some sense, I'm a little bit nervous too because in this room is one, my greatest hero, friends, colleagues, a former roommate, <laughs> my boss at one point, incredible people. And I'm nervous, excited as well, and extremely humbled. But before I start, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to the Toronto Re uh, Reference Library, to Yvonne Hunter, for giving us this incredible space to have this event tonight. So a huge round of applause to them. Thank you. Um, I wanted to thank Makayla, who's been incredible at, at making this whole event happen, to Jessica D. Humphreys for being my co-author, and Claudia Davila for giving me this opportunity to share my story in an incredible space, in a different way. Now, standing here tonight is a little bit, it's bittersweet, because on one hand, I'm extremely happy and humbled that my family has been given an opportunity to move forward with our story. But at the same time, I'm a bit sad because every time I've been turning on the news, I see children dying in the ocean, trying to survive, trying to get a refugee number so they can be recognized as human beings. Every day, I see that and I come so close to remembering all the atrocities that I went through every single day. Now tonight, I won't be talking too much about my story. I'll br briefly talk about my experience as a child soldier, but I wanted to talk about two important points that have helped me become the human being that you see in front of you today, that have helped me overcome all the challenges that I've seen in my life. And the first thing is courage. The second thing that I want to touch upon is the pursuit of knowledge. And I'll elaborate upon those two things later on in the presentation, but again, these are important themes that I hope I leave with you tonight. I was born on the eastern part of the Democratic Republic of Congo in a small little town in the eastern part called Beni. And as a child, I grew up in a beautiful family. And so before I tell you my story, I wanted to introduce you to my family. I want to introduce you to my father. His name is Ramazani Chikwanine. My father was a human rights lawyer. He was also, uh, he was specialized in land rights. What you don't see in this picture is my father's height. My father was about six foot eight, 250 pounds. A lot of people have asked me where my height went and I've <laughs> not been able to tell them. <laughs> so that's my father. This is my mother. Well, my father was also the coolest of all his colleagues. He's the one <laughs> with the glasses. This is my mother. My mother's name was Chibalonza Enungu Biamungu. She was a stay-at-home mom, but she also sold these beautiful clothing called Bikwembe's, which some of which you see in the picture. And the little guy you see in the picture, that's little Michel. I know it's cute. <laughs> and these are some of the clothes that she used to sell. This is my oldest sister. Her name is Vicky. My second sister, her name is Vivian. And my youngest sister, Marizia. And that's my family. And I grew up in my town of Beni in a very beautiful family, in a normal home. But in the early 1990s, there was a little bit of a conflict between the dictator who was, in put, was put in power by the United States called Mobutu Sese Seko, and a group of people called the Interahamwe's who were fighting for access to land. And they were fighting for access to land because before Europeans carved up the, the whole continent of Africa, people used to access land very freely. And so when the borders went up, the inter were finding it hard to access land into Congo. And so growing up in the town of Beni, we used to see army trucks pass by my house every single day. It wasn't strange to see, to wake up in the morning at five and see a tank rolling by your house as you're trying to make breakfast. And I grew up in this town and my father, to protect my family, put, it, put a rule in my home that everyone had to be home before 6 p.m. But as a five-year-old kid, I was a little bit of a troublemaker, and I always found ways to do the opposite of what my parents told me. And so one morning, as I was getting ready to go to school, I had my backpack on, and I was running down the stairs. My father pulled me aside, and he was extremely adamant that I'd be home before 6 p.m. And as a kid, I looked up at him, and I said, I promise I'll be back home before 6 p.m. So I ran to school, and halfway to school, I met my best friend Kevin, who was 12, or now is five. And the only reason why Kevin was my friend was because he was bigger than me. And as a kid, I'd fight kids who were bigger than me. So I made friends with Kevin so he'd fight for me and I'd watch him fight. And so I went to school and I remember the teacher was teaching math, he was teaching math class and I wasn't really good at math so I wasn't paying attention to him. 
And at the end of the day, the bell rang and the kids were running back home and I went to play soccer with my friends. But as we were playing, we saw a group of trucks just running and running into the field and they surrounded all the kids. We heard gunshots sounding everywhere. And the next few minutes, all I remember is being put into a truck, driving on a bumpy road for hours. After a few hours of driving, we stopped and we arrived at this rebel camp. We were told to get out. And as I took my first step out of the truck, I heard a crunch underneath my feet. So I looked on the ground and I saw skeletons. And there were hundreds and hundreds of skeletons scattered all across this field. And as a five-year-old child, I was so terrified of what I was watching, so I started to cry and I was panicking. Eventually, the rebel soldiers gathered us into a circle and they started counting. One, two, one, two. They told us all of who were given a number one were gonna to go to the left side. All who were number two were gonna to go to the right side. I was chosen as number one and my friend Kevin was put on the right side as number two. The next few moments, all we heard were this rebel commander running through the field saying, we are going to initiate into our army. They came up to me, they grabbed my left arm, they grabbed a knife and they slashed my wrist. And as I started to bleed, they took a substance called brown brown, which is a mixture of cocaine and gunpowder, and they rubbed this into the wound so I'd go crazy. They put a bandage over it, they grabbed a blindfold, they blindfolded me, they told me to put my hands out, and as I did, they dropped an AK-47 in my hand. But the gun was so heavy I couldn't lift it, I just dropped it on the ground. So the same rebel soldier came behind me, picked it up, he grabbed my finger, he put it on the trigger, and he kept yelling at me to shoot. And he kept yelling louder and louder, so I pulled the trigger. My hand shook and I dropped the gun on the ground. When the rebel soldier took off the blindfold, I remember looking at my right hand and it was shaking and there's blood dripping from it. I looked a few feet in front of me and my best friend Kevin was lying there in a pool of his own blood. At five years old, I was forced to kill my best friend as a way of being initiated into an army. And at first I thought that Kevin was okay. I can remember kept, I kept saying that he's gonna go to the hospital. He's gonna be okay. But Kevin never spoke. And for two weeks, we were put through training like this. And after two weeks of training, we were told that there was a village nearby that had food and gun supplies that we had to take over. So we were put into trucks, again, shipped off into this village. When we arrived there, the rebel commander gave the signal for all the kids to attack. But to this day, I can never explain to you what happened. All I remember feeling is this overwhelming sense of fear. Fear of my father punishing me for not being home at 6 p.m. So all I remember looking is trying to find a way out and I looked to my right and I saw a clearing of trees. I took a deep breath and I ran towards the trees as fast as I could. And I ran for three days and three nights in the jungle. And somehow, miraculously, I ended up in a town called Butembo, which wasn't far away from Beni, where my family lived. And that's how I escaped. To be very honest with you, that story never gets easier every time I tell it. It's one of the most heartbreaking parts of my life. But today, there's 250,000 child soldiers, as the general was just saying, and 40% of them are girls. And it would be a lie if I was to stand up here and tell you that everything that I've experienced in my life doesn't haunt me. It does. When I go to sleep, sometimes I go for weeks not being able to sleep because of the memories, because of nightmares. But this story has never been about me. This story does not define me. And the reason why I tell this story is because I see human beings dying all across the world. And that's why I tell it. And it's because of that reason that I believe that each and every one of us in this room has the ability and the responsibility to care. We all do to make human beings to live, to have a life. We all have that ability. And I wanted to touch upon something that my father left me. One thing that my father, two things actually that my father left for me that have been essential to my life. Courage. And for me, what courage means, means being able to stand up and not be afraid to stand out in a crowd. Not being afraid to ask questions that nobody else can ask. And the pursuit of knowledge for me means understanding history and how history is connected to all the issues that are happening in the world today. So I wanna talk about overcoming fear. I grew up with a father who was a human rights activist. 
And in, the 19, in 1998, when the first Congo was started, my father was writing articles about this rebel commander called Kakolele Mwamba, who was committing human rights atrocities all across Congo. And we were listening to the BBC in Kiswahili that morning, and I remember I asked my father if he's ever afraid of dying, because he was being targeted constantly. And my father told me one thing that I'll never forget. He looked at me and he said, every single human being will die at one point. It's inevitable. But the most important thing is not our, ourselves dying or ourselves being born. The most important thing is, that defines a human being is the legacy that they leave for their family, for their community, and the world. That's what defines us as human beings. And I believe that each and every one of us in here in this room has the ability to create positive change all across the world. But it needs to come with courage. And one of the greatest heroes of the world, one of my greatest heroes, Nelson Mandela once said, that courage is not the absence of fear, but the triumph over it. That a brave man is not one who's afraid, but one who conquers that fear. And when I think of the word courage, I think of my mother. My mother never finished school. She only went up to grade six because of family reasons, and so, but yet she was the smartest human being you'll ever meet. And when my father was assassinated in 2001 because of his human rights activism, my, father, my mother took on the mantle of being the mother, the father, and everything in between. As we lived as refugees in northern Uganda in a refugee camp, my mother would walk for three hours to the United Nations High Commission of Refugees office for three hours every single morning in one of the most dangerous streets in the world as a woman and would walk to wait behind this office just for us to get a refugee number because without a refugee number, you don't exist. You're not a human being and you won't get help. So I can empathize with the plight of refugees that we're seeing all across the world today. And my mother would walk and eventually we ended up getting a refugee number in 2004 and I ended up here in Canada on January 21st. And the reason why I'm standing here tonight speaking to you would not have happened if it wasn't for the relentless action of my mother and the courage that it took for her to take that action every single day so that we could be recognized as human beings. That was my mother. And I believe that if we're going to make a difference, that if we're going to make an impact in many of the issues that we're all passionate about, it has to be relentless action constantly. We cannot give up. And the other thing that my parents taught me was the pursuit of knowledge and how important that is. They taught me the pursuit of knowledge is, is being able to ask questions, being able to stand out and when somebody gives you information that's not true, being able to call them on it, being critical of that information. And I was very lucky to have grown up with a father who was so passionate about education. I remember as a kid growing up in Congo, my, my sister Marizia used to use her left hand when she was a child. And they used to beat her because in Congo and many parts of the world, you don't use your left hand because you don't have toilet paper. So when you go for a number two, you use water in your hand. And so most people eat on a communal plate, so you, use, you can't really eat there. It's offensive. So they used to hit my sister all the time trying to force her to eat with her right hand. But she would never change. So my father picked up a book and he was trying to understand why Marizia was using her left hand when nobody else in my family ever did. And he picked up this book that was written by a French psychologist who warned against the dangers of trying to force somebody to use their other hand when they're so naturally common. It's not naturally common for them to use the other hand. And from that day onwards, my father would yell, even hit if anybody ever touched Marizia. My father defied his own culture understanding for truth and reasoning. And it was at that point that I realized that it's important to be knowledgeable about everything, to be critical about everything in the world. But above all, other than teaching me that it takes relentless action to make a difference, that it takes courage and knowledge to be able to change some of the things that are going on in the world, my father left me with something that I hope to leave with you tonight. February 19, 2001. It's a date that I'll never forget in my entire life because that was the day my father was assassinated. But right before he was killed, my father said something that I'll never forget. He said, great men and great women all throughout history have never been described by their money or their success, but rather by their heart and what they do for others. So for all of us here in this room who are passionate, who have the ability and the responsibility to care, to make a difference in the world, we have to do it with relentless action, courage, passionate courage, 
and knowledge. And above all, we have to do it with a great heart. Thank you so much for having me here tonight. I'm honored and again, an incredible event. Thank you so much for making it out. Um, just a few words about Jessica. Uh, this is her second book on child soldiers. Um, she writes about international humanitarianism, military and children's issues. She hopes that the leaders of tomorrow who read this will ensure that there is no need for another book. This is an important book. I hope everything you hear tonight will stick with you and then you will go out in the world and become ambassadors and join these human beings who are trying so hard to make a difference. Jessica. Thank you all for coming. Um, Michelle Ciquinini, isn't he? Just adorable. Don't you love him? Don't you just, here, I'll give him a hug for all of you. So lovable. Michelle Tuquinini has uh, been personally affected by the scourge of child soldiers since he was practically a baby, as you heard. And General Dallaire has devoted his entire life to, to this cause. And I, with them, have spent the past seven years researching and writing about this issue. And uh, I, I, I hope I speak for all of us, and I think I do, when I say how pleased I am that this book is available now for the next generation of activists, and that um, we're confident that they will see the eradication of the use of child soldiers in their lifetime. Um, General Dallaire, you're the founder of the Child Soldier Initiative. I'll sit down. Can you tell us a little bit about how you're working to achieve that aim? Um, the Child Soldier Initiative, uh, which is now based at Dalhousie University, started when I, uh, in 2004, uh, got a fellowship at uh, Kennedy School at Harvard to do a research paper, and my research was on uh, the introduction in this era of very complicated conflicts, uh, the fact that we were, uh, in fact, using children uh, as a primary uh, instrument of war. Looking at it very much from an uh, operational, tactical, strategic, military perspective, which is a, a new dimension to this because up until then and until we've been able to come forward where uh, we now are training militaries and police uh, and educating children in different schools in different countries. Um, Child Soldiers was really the realm of the NGO world, the UNICEFs and so on, who would rehabilitate and reintegrate children after they were released. And those were the ones who survived. Uh, and they survived with many, many traumas, as Michel. And so we invested, the world has invested a lot of money in, in the after of that. Uh, we, in fact, decided that no, the aim has got to be in the front end of this. Let's stop the recruitment. Let's find a way to stop them from using them. And when they're using them, let's find another way to make them a liability to the ones who want to use them, the adults, make them ineffective without simply killing them, which is the current doctrine in the world and all armies and police uh, when confronting uh, child soldiers, based on the fundamental law of self-defense. And so uh, over about six years in Ottawa and now since 2010, we're in Dalhousie, where the team has been developing a new doctrinal framework on how to train militaries and police, prison guards, in how to defuse situations where child soldiers are used and how to be able to extract them and make them ineffective without killing them. And in the meantime, using ex-child soldiers and retraining them, have them supplement the school teachers and with comic books based in their country, like in the Congo, like in the Colombia, which we have now, 
go in and show the children the reality of what it means to be a child soldier, not get sucked in by promises that people make to them uh, in uh, the process of going after them. And so uh, we are now uh, not only training those militaries, we are being able to extract the children uh, and we are able then to hand them over for rehabilitation and reintegration. We've just finished, uh, finished uh, with the Canadian Army of changing their complete doctrine. When we were training in Sierra Leone, the British who were doing that uh, came to see our training and within half a day came to us and said, where were you when we were in Afghanistan facing these child soldiers? And found out that there was a whole bunch of things that they were doing that they could have avoided doing and probably avoided a lot of casualties. And one of the last points, if I may, is we create casualties on one side, that is the children's side, but we're creating casualties on our side too. Three months ago, there was a young sergeant came up to me in Quebec City where I live and uh, introduced himself and thanked me for the work we were doing. And he said, uh, he said I'm a sergeant in an infantry battalion. I said, oh yeah, and I said, uh, uh, how long have you been in the Army? He said, 12 years. I have, he said, how many missions have you been on? He said, five. So that's six months minimum each mission. There's a couple years of training in there. The soldiers that are being deployed now have more combat time than World War II vets. Hard combat time, facing complex situations like child soldiers. And so I asked him, I said, What's your, what was your job in the battalion? He says, I'm in the reconnaissance platoon. And I said, oh, and I said, what was your job in the reconnaissance platoon? And then he broke down. This very proud and confident sergeant completely broke down. And we went aside and it took a little while. And he told me, you know, he said, sir, I've been back over two years. And I have two children. And I haven't been able yet to pick them up to hug them. Because he was in the reconnaissance platoon that did the overwatch on the patrols and on the convoys. And they were responsible for making sure that no suicide bombers would blow up the convoy. No IEDs would be planted. And since 2009, the extremists were using children. How many children did he have to kill to prevent and save his own buddies and so on. And the effect, the PTSD effect on him has literally destroyed his ability to be a father and needs years of rehabilitation. So we're taking casualties also on our side by the ineptness of what we uh, have had in the past and that's what we're working on changing right now. Impressive, thank you. If there are any, yeah. If there are any questions from the audience, I think Michelle or General Dallaire or I <laughs> would be happy to take them. Oh, maybe you can come up to the microphone. Or thank talk, you. or talk very loud, or I'm an artillery officer. If you could keep your comments short and your questions succinct, that would be thank great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. My name is Gilbert. I, um, I come from Rwanda. I was only 10 when uh, the general and his men were trying to save m most of us. We are very, very fortunate to have survived. Um, mine here is a really a worry um, that I have. I spoke to Michel about his experience, and he told me when he told me about the guy who um, helped him hold the gun and shoot his best friend, Kevin, I couldn't help but think about that guy. That guy today could be a general in the army in Congo. He could be a minister. He could be anything. Uh, despite all the atrocities that he has committed, all the uh, bad things that he has done, um, 
uh, inflicting child soldiers and uh, making them commit those crimes. I worry about those people. General, do you worry about um, the people who get away with that kind of atrocities? Do you worry about that? Is there uh, anything the international community is not doing um, yeah. that it should be doing to track those people down and really make sure that they, they are brought to books? It, it, uh, I'm talking, uh, what, an ex uh, what an excellent and pertinent question, and well done. Um, over the last, in fact, nearly 20 years, because the phenomenon of the use of children as a primary system, we're not talking about a couple kids on the side, we're talking as primary system started in Mozambique, really, uh, in, the, in the late 80s, uh, and has sustained itself uh, to which last year was the worst year in all history of use of child soldiers. So uh, the international community has been aware of it and countries like Canada have led uh, in establishing not only the child rights uh, side of the house, but the optional protocol on child rights. It says that it's a crime against humanity to recruit anybody under the age of 18 and to train them and use them in conflict. Uh, and so there is a whole plethora of uh, rules and laws out there. The International Criminal Court, which we also kind of led in introducing and creating, uh, has the ability to prosecute these people. There's just a little problem, is that it doesn't have a police force to do it. It doesn't have the political will or access to the political will in countries who have the capability of going after those bad guys want to do it. It's not perceived as a priority. It's seen as a social economic problem instead of being a security problem. And right now that security problem is even here because we're training now the police in Toronto, Montreal, and Edmonton about radicalization in our diaspora gangs, Aboriginal gangs, and their recruitment. And so we're using stuff that we're training in other countries to help train our own police to prevent that. So this recruitment is going on by these bad people. Just recently, we were in Slovenia because what we were arguing is, is that any organization that's willing to recruit children to do these evil deeds, and shooting is only one small part of it, is an organization that's willing to go to mass atrocities, even genocide. And so. We've been arguing that it's an early warning. So we could have avoided some of the massive massacres in Central African Republic when we knew four, nearly five years ago that they were recruiting child soldiers and that they would go to an extreme. So the prosecutor of the International Criminal Court has asked us to write through workshops with child soldiers. We're doing one in Colombia. We've done one here in Canada and North American child soldiers that are here now, and we're doing another one in Africa. We are writing the policy to help the prosecutors find the information they need to prosecute the bad guys and bring them to, bring them to, uh, to justice. And right now, we've only had a few, and they've been very ineffective because the defense lawyers have torn apart the child soldiers when they're being interviewed because they haven't found a way to protect these kids as they're giving their testimony. And so the couple of them who've done the recruitment have gotten off on the whole sexual side of it. The sexual abuse of the girls who end up at 14 with one child and so on and, and the massive rapes that they caught up and so on. So uh, they weren't able to prove it because they literally literally, and this is from the chief prosecutor, destroyed what was left of those children in the defense of these bad guys, which the court then found itself unable to respond. That's why we've been asked to write uh, for the pro chief prosecutor uh, the doctrine, the policies that they need in order to protect the, child, the children when they're being brought forward and get at the bad guys and put them in jail for a long time. Thank you very much for that question. Michelle, are there, are there, do you have, what are your perspectives on, 
on that, on the perpetrators? Do you feel that we're doing enough in the international community to bring these people to justice, or do you think that's not the point? Can you reflect on that? I think at least for the last one of the soldiers, I think, in the Congo, his name was Thomas Lubanga, who was as well responsible for recruiting a lot of child soldiers in the northern eastern part of the Congo. Uh, he was brought to justice, and for a lot of Congolese children, a lot of children who had went through experience like mine, that was a win. It, was, it, was, it showed that people do care, and that there is an important lesson in learn, to learn in that, in that, that if we are to bring people who, who use children in, in war to court, we need to have the tools to be able to actually prosecute them. And this is where, for me, it's so important, and I'm really glad to hear that there is, that there is a huge effort to try and protect children, especially when they're in a setting like a court. Uh, and so I don't think we've done enough. I think it's just it's, it's the beginning of it, and I hope we continue to learn more from some of the mistakes that we've done and, and, and the lessons that we're learning from them as well. There's, a, there's an NGO called Justice, Justice Rapid Response out of Geneva that we are working with uh, to, in fact, give training to, pro to investigators to be able to find the information that they need to prosecute these people. Because that's another dimension, is what are the proof that they need to, to prosecute them. And one little angle, there is now a case in front of the International Tribunal where this kid, this young person was recruited at 13. Now he's 20. And he's been for two years continuing the fight. And the question is, is he really accountable now that he's 18, 19, 20 for a way of life that he'd been totally indoctrinated into and had lost complete contact with the rest of the world? And so the complexities of it are not, uh, not resolved yet. It's a familiar story. Hi. Um, good evening. Um, my name is George, and I used to live way up in Saskatchewan where it's very cold compared to your country. Uh, the concept of humanitarianism is vital for the people on planet Earth. In my view, and I am naive, lots to learn, even the courts and the law does not protect humanitarianism. In our country here, we have homeless, we have low-income people that have died on the streets, we protest, and it goes for nothing. So the problem of humanitarianism is widespread, and it is somehow overruled by capitalism, money, power, comfort. One of my dreams of a solution would be similar to where our students in our colleges and universities would go to outside our country and take jobs and learn the systems of people in other countries, come back and have an exchange so we can get more of a, of a world viewpoint rather yeah. than being protected in our country surrounded by oceans. Yeah. Michelle, do so you forth. agree that people should get their boots dirty in other countries and experience the world? I'm, I'm very thankful for your question. Actually, uh, the idea of humanitarianism, humanitarianism to me is a little contentious. I, I, I like it and I dislike it in so many different ways. Uh, but for me, I think, one, we, we have to not go there all the time to, we can't send, continually sending people to the continent of Africa to help or any other part of the world, developing world, to, to help them change. It has to come from themselves. And, and I think it's such an important aspect of it. But where we can do, and I, I loved what you brought up, what we can do as students, for example, as a student at the University of Toronto, I would love to see humanitarianism turn into where a, a university in Toronto that has incredible knowledge, that has incredible access to knowledge, 
is somehow shared with colleges and universities on the continent of Africa or in South America to ask questions where we can have students here lead into questions on the continent where we can ask African students what, let's say, colonialism, how does he affects them on a day-to-day -day basis and how that continues. So I think the idea of sharing knowledge is such an important aspect and I think that's to me where I want to see humanitarianism, the access to knowledge for a lot of people around the world. I would respond with the following and I'll reinforce uh, from a different angle, Michel. I, I do believe that it is important that you see, touch, smell, uh, feel the reality of what is happening to 80% of humanity out there. We, those from the 20% of the haves. And I think that instills a passion and lights a pilot, a pilot light in your gut in regards to your sensitivity to what you have and what you're doing and how you might influence others. So I, I'll go as far as to say I think there should be a rite of passage in this country after high school or undergrad that everybody should have a pair of boots underneath their bed that's been soiled in those countries uh, in order just to know about it. But the other side of the story that I think is important uh, and as we, we discussed uh, in this dimension of humanitarianism uh, is the fact uh, that we can engage in humanitarianism right from home. Join the NGO world right here. There's NGOs in town. There's local NGOs. There's municipal NGOs. There's provincial. There's uh, national. There's international NGOs. We have, as this gentleman has said, people in the streets and some of them dying. Well, we have young veterans, again, like we had in the 40s and 50s. We have young veterans in the streets now dying. And so there is a significant problem to resolve and commit ourselves to human beings uh, that we see suffering like that. Thank you very much. Um, in closing, I'd just like to sum it up with a, with a humoristic joke. Fire the men. Put the women in charge, and everything will be settled and properly done. <laughs> Thank you. There's a lot to be said about empowerment of women. Yeah. Empowerment of women mixed with education yeah. will crack the code in many of those male-dominated societies. And that's a worthy investment, certainly. Before you ask your question, can I just remind everyone that in the, in the book that we're talking about here today, the latter half of the book is, is more than just Michelle's story. It's more information about child soldiers, including what you can do and what your children, more importantly, frankly, can do to help in their own communities and globally with this issue and with humanitarianism generally. So, please. Um, Philip Wood, I worked for many years in DR Congo, Bunya, and in Beni. Um, I think your audience might be a little surprised that up until this point we haven't mentioned the United Nations, United Nations peacekeeping forces. I know, General, your experience in Rwanda was very disappointing, and I would say in Congo with 17,000 peacekeeping forces, uh, we are very, very disappointed in, in, the, in the peace that they are, are trying to keep. But do you think that the United Nations peacekeeping forces could have a much greater role to play in this problem of child soldiers? I, I, it's nearly I planted that one. Uh, <laughs> the first thing, in fact, that we've discovered is we've got to train those peacekeeping forces to recognize that there are other means of neutralizing these child soldiers and simply killing them or backing off and letting the child soldiers continue to do uh, their deed. And so that's why we're in many countries, uh, not only training their military and their police for their own countries, uh, but also for contingents to be deployed. However, coming back to the UN and the UN forces, I mean, the Congo had 17,000 
peacekeepers. In fact, it went up to 24,000 at one point. But if they're ineffective, if they don't know what they're doing, if they don't have any equipment, they got poor leadership, they've got very poor training, they're nothing more than a waste of rations. They're a waste of money. And on the contrary, can create significant problems in there by abuses, things like sexual abuses of the locals and fraternization and so on. So uh, the UN now has over 100,000 peacekeepers in 18 missions around the world. 100,000. There are 43 Canadians peacekeepers. And we invented it. So when the Cold War ended, if you remember the Cold War, some of you, 1989, when that ended, we wanted the peace dividend, right? We don't need big armies anymore. Get rid of them. Then all of a sudden, all these imploding nations and failing states and civil wars appeared. And all of a sudden, we said, oh, geez, we, we, need, we need peacekeepers to help stabilize those countries and then help them reconstitute themselves and build and so on. So who answered the call? We didn't. The developed countries didn't. The northern countries didn't. We abdicated that to the developing countries who don't have the technology, don't have the equipment, don't have the resources to sustain the forces in the field, don't have the training in order to be able to wrest the initiative from the bad guys in these far more complex missions than they were during the Cold War when we were there with short pants, a blue beret, a baseball bat, and no red card or penalty box. We were there to observe. Yeah, we observed a lot of people get slaughtered when the Cold War ended. What we need is, yeah, blue helmets with the ability to take the initiative from the bad guys and protect the civilian population. And we have abdicated that, and so many other countries have. And because of that, yeah, the UN is getting a black eye, only because other countries are willing to do it. And in so doing, they realize that they don't have all the tools to succeed. So that's a mea culpa. Michelle? To add just to that point as well, I would also say, I mean, the African Union itself also has peacekeeping forces. Also, I, I, I would like to see that training be added to African armies or you know armies from developing worlds. That training, so that when the blue berets do leave these communities, there's a sustainable force of the local community that can able to sustain peace and and the structures that are there in the first place. Because one of the worst things that happened to Africa, and I, I truly believe this, is when colonialism happened. We brought in a terrible, another different system on the continent. Then they left. What happened? Right? And I think that we keep making that mistake where we're bringing in new ways and new dimensions to try and help on the continent, and then we leave without training the people to sustain them. And so another dimension to add to that, what, to what you just said, is, is the, the, the training of African peacekeepers, say through the African Union, uh, to sustain that peace as well when you know, the UN does leave. Hi there, thank you very much. It was uh, very informative. Um, I wonder if I could ask Dr. Uh, Romeo Dallaire, the issue with the, the UN peacekeeping force, which I think you alluded to, I read your book some time ago, um, was that but with, the UN, with the peacekeeping mission, both sides are assumed to be, have equal merit or equal dismerit in terms of the conflict that's arisen. And I'm just wondering, perhaps you could so comment about the confidence you had uh, in dealing with the Rwanda issue where your empathies were, must have been, in situations where your empathies must be slightly torn about uh, whether that's actually the case and how you have become, you know, what the real mandate of the peacekeeping mission is. And if it's going to form this, you know, it doesn't preclude subsequent prosecutions. What the, what the effect of those prosecutions is on a community that's sort of been through that process and how that compares to like a Truth and Reconciliation Commission and how many of your child soldiers want to, to go through that process? 
And wh um, how accurate would your information be at the end of that? How, how accurate in terms of the gathering? I, I noticed in your book that New York was sort of, you weren't able to get a response from New York in your crisis, that you were being faxing and faxing, getting nowhere there. Okay, and you've touched on a number of points. Um, first of all, um, reconciliation is crucial to the prevention of conflict. Uh, because if not, it's going to happen again. And so in the case of Rwanda, uh, over 100,000 Rwandans in one way or another were involved in the slaughter. How do you put 100,000 people in jail when you don't own a jail? So uh, there was the International Criminal Court that was created uh, for a tribunal for Rwanda, but there was the Gachacha, which was the local means of uh, uh, justice in the communities for people who perpetrated different levels of, of, uh, uh, of exactations on others. Uh, and so at one point, even rape was being handled at that level, but they realized that that was too evil uh, 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 um, an injustice. And so uh, the International Criminal Court said, no, it's a, it's a crime against humanity, rape, to use rape in conflict. And so uh, that was uh, pulled out of the case. So you've got, you got the local system that, that went on. Uh, the children who get caught up in this, uh, it says that if you're under 18, you are not liable uh, for criminal proceedings. However, you can go in front of a judicial non-punitive process to show that you know, there's been a justice process of which you've been recognized having gone through. And from there on, then you are rehabilitated and reintegrated. You're not thrown in jail. There's no such thing as a volunteer child soldier. There's like just no such thing as consenting adults in the conflict zone. People just don't fall in love in the middle of a conflict zone with a peacekeeper. They do it because they need money for their family and protection and food. And so children end up doing the similar scenarios and get caught up into that maelstrom. And so uh, we could talk about Omar Qadar with no problem at all in this circumstance. Uh, and so under the 18, they are to be handled and rehabilitated, reintegrated, and the communities have got to be re-educated uh, uh, to trust these kids when they come home. Because in many cases, they're worried of what they've learned, and so whenever there's a problem, these kids are often accused, and so you've got to prepare the community for them also. And that is often forgotten, and we've seen child soldiers come home and get killed by their own people. The girls are worse because if they've been, you know, they've been abused, they, often the communities don't want them anymore. And so even their families don't want them. So they end up aimlessly with children uh, around and continue to be abused. And that's, that's, I think, a sin which I consider above even a crime against humanity. Yeah. In regards to the, the, the troops uh, in, in Rwanda and uh, how do you keep neutrality, uh, well, that's a very interesting point because uh, we found out that that doesn't work. Uh, when both sides, right up until the end of the Cold War, both sides were fighting, and it used to be a state against another state or a bunch of states against another state. And so because of whatever reason, borders or resources or something, so you had countries fighting countries. At one point, they got tired of fighting or they come to some sort of stalemate, and then they want a peace agreement, and all they want then is a, is a referee to help them. And that's what peacekeeping was. It's and certainly more complex now. Yeah, well, absolutely. Indeed. And so the refereeing uh, at the time was because both sides wanted you there, and you worked out the problems with them. When that ended, and we ended in civil wars, in imploding nations, it's Rwandans killing Rwandans. Who's the good one and who's the bad one? And how do you break that out? And so we've ended up in an era of trying to figure out how do you protect the innocent civilians in this problem? 
And so we're into chapter seven out of the uh, mandate, which is blue helmets, which means be prepared to use force to protect the civilians and let us sort out the government people or the rebel people separately, but don't let them have access to the population. We deploy to protect the population. And so we didn't do it in Libya. We certainly didn't do it in Syria. And because of that, we now have massive problems. Although the responsibility to protect doctrine says that we also initiated, says since 2005, we have a responsibility to go in and protect people when they're massively abused by human rights because sovereignty is no more an absolute. I it's, remember, oh, sorry. It's the sovereignty of the individual, not the sovereignty of the state that is now the dominant element of humanity. I was going to say that I remember we were working on a, a previous book about child soldiers and this complexity for the UN peacekeepers came up in the sense of imagining yourself, you, yourself, being tasked to protect a village, let's say. And you've got people behind you that you're tasked to protect. And you're coming over a hill. You see soldiers coming towards you with their guns out. They're going to kill the people behind you. They're going to kill you. So you aim and you realize that person is a child. And it turns out it's a child soldier. And you have a nanosecond to make a decision. And you're ill-prepared and untrained. And the emotional factor is there profoundly. Um, it, the complexity is, is something for which I think our peacekeepers are extremely ill-prepared and everyone suffers. Did you have, I think we only have about five more minutes, one, one more question. minute, one more question. <laughs> Just so that I can say, I'm sorry because the library closes and we do want Michelle and the general to sit down and sign. So following on the last question, just take your question to the table and hopefully you'll have a moment to talk That's to these guys, idea. okay? Super, thank you. Good evening, thank you for your, uh, your speech. Uh, I really wanted to know, do you know whatever happened to that seven-year-old? To the what? That seven-year-old boy that you talked about at the beginning. What a, what a lovely question. Um, I looked at that child and I wanted to adopt him right there on the ground, right immediately. And uh, what happened was uh, a rebel force patrol came by. I had four soldiers with me. Uh, they were over 20. And they said, don't worry, General, we'll take care of them, we'll protect them, we'll feed them and try to get them home. And uh, in uh, the scenario that ultimately happened and a standoff, uh, we did let them do that, but what we did is we reported it to the International Red Cross and had the International Red Cross check on whether that child was being protected by the rebel force. And it was. And so there is a, a way of trying to get through by using other assets to do it. But uh, it, was a, it was a horrible loss of not being able to take them and, and bring them home with us. Yes, thank you for, that's an extraordinary question, thank you. I'm sure every single one of us wanted to take sweet little Michelle at five years old and <laughs> put him in our houses. Do you wanna say a few last words, Michelle? Honestly, yeah. I, there's so much I could say, but I just wanna say thank you so much for taking the time to be here. It's an absolute honor and, and I hope you have a great night, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.